as we've been taking snapshots of, uh, out of 1 John. Let's start here. We're up to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. He says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And again, John just has a wonderful way of just cutting things between light and darkness, doesn't he? This very matter of fact. But he says, number one, love not the world. And if you look at those definitions of love, it means to be fond of, to welcome, to entertain, to be pleased with. And he's going to go on here in the next verse, and he's going to identify what the world is when he says love not the world. When he says love not the world, he's not necessarily talking about, you know, you can't love the mountains and you can't, you know, don't love the ocean and don't love. No, those things were all created for our habitation. They were all created for our pleasure. And so that's not what he's saying when he says love not the world. He's really saying love not the world system. And it's kind of a sad story, isn't it, when you think of it? Because he created this world perfect and he created this world for us to be paradise for us. And now the world system, this whole uh, system of life that he created has now turned against him and is his enemy and is in rebellion towards him. And so that's why he says, love not the world, meaning don't love this world system. Don't love the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Don't be fond of those things. Don't entertain those things. Don't be pleased with those things. Neither the things that are in the world. You know, when you start to consider all of the things that are in this world system and things that are just uh, continuing to multiply at such a rate, you know, I mean, internet and TV and all types of pleasures and distractions and cares and everything that you can get involved in and everything that can rob you of time. And you really need to start seeing the things of this world system as your enemy. They are there to take you away from God. They are there to distract you from God. They are there to weigh you down. And so he says, don't be fond of this world system, neither the things that are in the world. And you know, that's really is something that's cultivated. I'm sure that you've learned that in your walk with the Lord. You, you practice filling yourself up and satisfying yourself with the things of God. And as you do this, the things of the world, you, you will abhor the things of this world more and more. And the things of this world won't have any interest to you. They won't be desirous to you. They won't satisfy you. And so it's something that's cultivated to where we learn how to love God more and more and love the world less and less. But it's got to be cultivated. You have to fill yourself with the things of God, the Word of God, and learn how to be satisfied truly in Him. And the things of the world will grow strangely dim. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is what? Is not in him. You can't have both feet in both worlds. You have to choose who you're going to serve. And I think even one of the great testimonies that you are born again is the fact that when we do kind of fall back into finding our fulfillment or finding pleasure in the things of the world, how does it make you feel afterwards? You know, after the momentary thrill is gone, you kind of feel cheap, you feel guilty, you feel like you've betrayed the first love of your life, Jesus. And uh, that, that shame and that guilt and that emptiness is good because it means that the love of the world really is not in you, though you momentarily fell back into it, you've got the love of the Father. You know that there's much more to live for than the things in this world system. If any man loved the world, if, if that's what you're consumed with, if that's all you pursue, then you don't know anything about love of the Father. But when you're born again and you truly love your heavenly Father, this world becomes so empty and dark and dismal to you and 
it attracts you less and less, and you just want to be with your heavenly Father more and more. So love not the world. Don't, don't be fond of this world system. Don't welcome it. Don't entertain it. Fill yourself up with God and the goodness of God is what he's saying here. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I put there in your notes, just a couple of notes about verse 16. Number one, there is a line where God-given wholesome desire becomes lust and sin. And you know, I think this is, this is one of the tricky things about learning how to walk this line of holiness in this world system. Because one of the most practical examples I can think of is just take sex for a moment. Sex was given to a man and a woman as an expression of love, and it's, and it's a desire that's, that's God-given that's built into us, and it's supposed to bring you and your spouse into great intimacy. It's supposed to draw you two together, isn't it? But what happens when that God-given desire becomes perverted and it is now expressed outside of marriage? Now it becomes lust. And so, you know, Satan takes what is God-given, what was meant for our good, and he perverts it to evil, to lust, to sin. And what was good and holy before God and what can still be good and holy before God now becomes fornication and adultery. And then I put in there your notes just some, just some other examples like a sense of accomplishment versus self-exaltation. How many of you have done a project at work or done a project at the home and you finish the project and you look at it and you feel really good about it? You know, you're kind of proud of it. You call your wife, you say, hey, look what I did. Or you call your husband, or, look how this turned out. That kind of sense of accomplishment is good. The book of Ecclesiastes says that that's supposed to be there. That's not pride. That's feeling good about what you were able to do and, and how, what God enabled you to do. But if you take that and start using it to exalt yourself, now what is good has become what? Pride. And so we, we want to walk that line of never crossing over into lust. You know, I put there a healthy self-image as God's child. You, you, we're supposed to walk around every day feeling very special. God loves me. God created me. I have no idea why, I don't deserve it, but he thought high enough of me to send his son to die for me, to redeem me. Not that I have any intrinsic value in and of myself, but that's how much he loved me. That's how much he was willing to pay for me. Well, that should give you a healthy self-image. I'm not some, you know, poor, depressed worm crawling around in the dirt I have been purchased with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I'm a special creation of God. Well, you should have that healthy self-image, but if you cross that line into perversion, it becomes egotism, or even worse, narcissism, where you just really think the whole world revolves around you, and you're the elite, you're better than everybody else. So that's, you know, these are just some examples of good, wholesome desires. What about admiration versus covetousness? You know, there's nothing wrong with looking at something beautiful and saying, wow, that's beautiful. But then when you cross that line into covetousness and saying, I deserve that, I want that, it doesn't belong to me, but I'm going to take it anyway, well, now you've crossed the line over into lust and sin. And so I put there that line is crossed whenever God's word is transgressed. You know, that, that, that transition between desire and lust, what makes one right, what makes the other wrong? Well, whenever God's word is transgressed, now you're in sin, now you're in lust. Because God's commandments are for our good. God's commandments are never to limit us or oppress us or to suppress us. God's word is always to bring us life and liberty. But whenever we cross that, cross the boundaries of his commandments, now that desire has turned into lust. That line is crossed when, we des when what we desire is an idol. It's not surrendered to God. It's exalted above God. You know, maybe you're, 
your dream is to make 500k a year. And uh, it's one thing to desire that, but then be content with 35k because that's where God has you. But if you make 500k, you're idle and and it's not surrendered to the Lord and you're exalting it above God and you're just going to try to force and make that happen no matter what the cost to you or your family, well, now that desire has turned into perversion, hasn't it? That line is crossed when we're discontent with God's plan and with God's provision. When we say what God has ordained for my life is not good enough, I deserve better or I deserve better or different or I deserve more. Okay, so those are just some examples of how we can discern between a desire and a lust. When, a, when does a wholesome desire turn into lust? It's a good thing for you to want to provide for your family and to have enough money to provide for all of their needs. But it turns into lust when you're no longer content with what God provides for you and you're striving to be rich in this world or to live up to a certain image or to live up to a certain standard of pleasure and status. All right? I put there through the trial and error of life experience where you learn where that line is for ourselves. Haven't you learned that? You know, as you go through life, you begin to, you know, what we're talking about is a lot of heart attitudes here, and you begin to learn, oh, that desire got the better of me. And that desire turned into lust. And I started to elevate that desire above my pursuit of God, and it became an idol in my heart. And so we begin, you know, through maturity and through the trial and error of life experience, we kind of figure out where that line is between desire and lust. And so back here in, uh, in 1 John chapter 2, where he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, we're talking about when we cross that line from desire into lust. The desires of your flesh are not bad. You get hungry, you get thirsty, that's the way God made you. Your body needs rest, that's the way God made you. You have those desires, that's all healthy and good. The lust of the eyes, God made your eyes to look at something beautiful and admire it. There's nothing wrong with that, but it can't cross over into lust. The pride of life, you know, feeling good about a job well done, God has built that into each one of us. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you start to use it egotistically for for a self-exaltation, now you're involved in the pride of life. So he's saying don't begin to operate the way that the world operates in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. James chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterers and adulteresses. What's an adulterer? What, who is someone who commits adultery? Committing adultery is finding pleasure in something else other than where you're supposed to find your pleasure. And so when you're finding your pleasure in something else other than God, that's when you have committed spiritual adultery. And he says, you adulterers and adultery, adulteresses, you've forsaken your first love, you've forsaken who your pleasure is to be in, you've forsaken God. Don't you know that the friendship of the world is what? Enmity with God, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So if, if you are a friend to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, if you find your pleasure in fulfilling the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you have now made yourself the enemy of God. And I put there in your notes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is so opposed to the very nature, character, and will of God that to favor one is to become the enemy of the other. That I think we really need to keep that in mind the next time we're tempted to sin. If, if we could just pause for a moment when we're being tempted to commit that sin, when we're being tempted to gratify some carnal desire on the inside of us, whether it's a lustful thought or whether it's the temptation to unforgiveness or to become angry or whatever it is, if you would stop and tell yourself, 
for me to follow through with gratifying this desire is to make myself the enemy of God. You know, because we treat it pretty easily, don't we? I mean, we, we think, oh, I can commit a sin and then confess it and then just come right back to God. It'll be okay. You know, it, it's kind of like being a citizen of the United States and saying, well, you know what? I can go play with ISIS for a day and then it'll be okay and then the next day I'll come right back to America and I'll be a U.S. citizen again. Now, doesn't that sound stupid to even say something like that? If you go play with ISIS for a day, you may not make it back. In fact, chances are real high you're not going to make it back. But yet we do this in the spiritual realm all the time. I'm a child of God. I'm in the kingdom of light. But it's okay. I can go play in the kingdom of darkness for an hour or for a day. And then I'll just bounce right back. And, and, uh, and our minds have become deceived into thinking, I can just bounce back and forth between kingdom to kingdom and keep my feet in both worlds. And no, you can't. To be a friend of the world is to be the enemy of God. And so we've got to get it out of our minds that it's acceptable or okay to bounce back and forth between a spiritual life and a life of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, don't get me wrong. All of us, unfortunately, fall into that kingdom of darkness from time to time, don't we? Far more than we want to. But we have to understand what's at stake here. And, you know, put it in something that your mind can relate to. You wouldn't even think for a moment of going and playing with ISIS for a day and then coming back and being a U.S. citizen again. Why would you do that in the spiritual realm? Why would you open yourself up to that kind of power? That's the other thing, you know, we need to realize. When we willingly voluntarily gratify that desire and entertain that sin, you are opening yourself up to the powers of the kingdom of darkness. You're opening the gate and saying, here I am, I invite you in. Now, why would we do that? Doesn't make any sense, does it? There's no common ground between God's kingdom and this world system. That's why he says, Friendship of the world is enmity with God. Don't bounce back and forth between the two kingdoms. Make a stand. Realize the thrill of this is going to be over with in a minute, and I'm going to be found in the kingdom of darkness, having opened up my life and heart to the powers of that darkness. I put there in your notes, every lust gratified is taking one step away from Father, and one step into the world and the evil powers which control the world. Realize this, the seriousness and the gravity of this and stay away from sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. You know, the, the, the human princes of this world, for lack of a better term, the, you know, the kings, the presidents, the prime ministers, the generals, the admirals, all of those that are in power who think that they have the power to make things happen in this world, do you realize they are nothing but puppets? They are nothing but puppets in the hands of the God of this world system. They're doing his bidding if they are not saved and born again. And the course of this world is going according to the prince of the power of the air. They are not the ones in control. He's in control. The Illuminati, the, the conspirators, whatever you want to call them, they are puppets in the hands of Satan. And they think they're in control, but they're really not. It's going according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of what? That's an interesting term, the children of disobedience. Those that profess to be children of God, but they are disobedient 
children. They profess to be Christians, but there is a, there's a power that's at work in them that's causing them to disobey God's commandments. And they think they can flirt with the world and they think they can operate in the world, but they are under the power of the prince of the air. The kingdom of darkness. This is how serious sin is. Sin is nothing to dabble with. Sin is nothing to entertain, to flirt with. Sin will destroy you. Sin never helps. It never saves. It never feels good. Sin will destroy you 100% of the time. It will damn your soul to hell. And it's nothing to be flirted with or played with. Among whom we also had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. It's amazing what comes into our mind, isn't it? You know, we get all of these vain imaginations of how good this would be or how good this would feel or how happy this would make me. And it's all just a smokescreen. It's an empty, vain dream, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and your idols. You can't serve God and your desires. We have to serve God with all of our heart. And then as we close, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 this is why he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, do what? Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Abstain. It's not a thing of it's okay to do it a little bit or just flirt with it a little bit. What did he say? abstain from fleshly lust because they war against the soul. How do they war against the soul? I just want to quickly touch on these four words. Every lust gratified degrades and corrupts, number one, your conscience. Isn't it a bummer when you have a, a, a bad conscience, a guilty conscience? Isn't, isn't there just something good and peaceful and joyful about having a clean conscience? You know, Paul says that he labored to make sure that he always had a conscience that was clear. When you know you've done your best to serve God and to do what's right. And you don't have, you're not hiding any secret sins. You're not doing anything in secret. You know, you, everything in your life is lived out in the open. You wouldn't have any problem with your life being put up on the screens here for all to see. That's a clean way of living. It's a good way of living. There's joy and there's peace in that kind of living. But when you begin to flirt with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and you start dipping your toe back into this world system, your conscience becomes guilty and defiled. And because of that, you're hesitant to approach God. You don't have the joy of the Lord anymore. Every lust gratified degrades and corrupts your integrity. Gets easier and easier to make the next decision in sin, doesn't it? You know, you, you kind of break the envelope, you kind of break the barrier, you break the boundary, you, you commit sin, and then, you know, a day later, two days later, you're tempted with that same sin again. It gets easier and easier to commit the sin each time. And pretty soon your integrity is eroding. And pretty soon you do anything just for that fix one more time. And you lie to cover it up, and you cheat, and you steal, because your integrity is being compromised more each and every time. It degrades and corrupts your discernment. You know, pretty soon you're excusing sin. Pretty soon you're saying, well, it's not that bad. And then you're saying, well, I, I don't even think it's really sinful. And pretty soon your discernment of right and wrong 
is eroded and corrupted. And you don't know how far you're drifting back into that kingdom of darkness. It's a bad, bad place to be. You know, when you're truly holy and pure, even what seems to be somewhat innocent commercials on TV offend you. But when you're flirting with that sin, you're thinking, what? what's the big deal? It's, it's not like a horror movie. It's not like pornography. It's not like... But yet you're taking pleasure in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you are back in the center of God's will where you're supposed to be, even the very suggestion, even the very innuendo would offend you. But see, your discernment begins to be corrupted. And then your communion with Father is corrupted. You don't have the joy of His presence and you don't have the joy of the Lord. You don't have that abiding with Him. And so as we pray tonight, just pray that Father would keep you safe from the evil one. Just pray that Father will give you a heart that hates the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Don't find your pleasure or your satisfaction in this world system. It's death. There's nothing but death. And just remember, every time I satisfy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life, it is just like going and playing with Isis for a day. I am joining myself to the enemy of God, to the enemy of my soul. Nothing good will ever come from this. And cling to God. Commit yourself afresh to your heavenly Father who is the true life and satisfaction of your heart. As we go to prayer, oh, don't forget that too, that's a, I put there just as one last final note, temptation is not defeated in the battle. Temptation is defeated in the preparation. And we've talked about that many times before. That's why he says here to abstain from fleshly lusts. And you all know exactly what I'm talking about. If you try to deny or resist the temptation in the middle of the battle, when you're going, no, I won't, yes, I will, no, I won't, yeah. most of the time you lose. It's too late. Every day you go out, you better prepare yourself in prayer and in the Word of God first before you take one step out of the house, before you take one step onto the job, because once the day gets going, it's too late. And if a battle of temptation arises in the middle of the day, you're probably going down if you haven't prepared yourself properly in God's presence first. 